Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening and welcome to the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre's Tuesday Talks. Lovely to see such a big audience here. And um, before I go any further, um, can I just get a nod or a wave to let me know that you can hear me okay? Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that, because I know you guys are all muted. And if you would stay that way until the question and answer session, it's, it stops any background noise whilst we're going through these talks. So my name is Andrew Hearn, and I'm chair of the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre. This is this this man behind me here. And also this is the centre behind me here too. Um, and this is one of my last official duties, I believe, as chair um, to host this talk for you this evening because I'm retiring at the end of the year and I'm handing over to Professor Lance Butler, who you probably know, who usually, oh, he's here, he's waving to me as well. He's waving to his mail, who usually chairs these evenings. So Lance takes over for, from me at the end of the year. So uh, tonight um, is, I say, one of my final duties. And I'm delighted to do that this evening because it's a very good friend of mine, Nick Kyle, who will be speaking to you this evening. Now, um, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> I've known Nick for over 20 years, but we, we were 12 at the time. <laughs> Um, so I, I've known him a long time and he is a very good friend. Um, Nick's background is in teaching. He was a deputy head teacher, but he's also a former president of the Scottish Society for Psychical Research. And that is where I met him. Now, Nick is one of only a handful of people who were invited to the school group to witness physical phenomenon. And if you haven't, if you don't know about that, I'm sure he'll be including that in his talk tonight, but that's one of the most evidential um, experiences of physical mediumship anywhere in the world. And it is subject to scientific research and there is a scientific, in fact, more than one scientific journal on that, that case. And I say Nick was one of the few people who were allowed to, to witness that. So tonight he's going to be talking about physical mediumship and bringing it right up to date. So I'm delighted to hear from him as well. So without further ado, let me pass the chair on to Nick Kyle. Welcome, Nick, and thank you for being here. Thanks, Anne. And Thanks to everyone for turning out on what is certainly a cold winter's night in Scotland. Um, and I know that some of you are far afield, so it may not be cold and wet where you are. Um, I see one or two friends uh, in the, uh, the audience, um, but uh, I'll get stuck straight into my talk. Bringing physical mediumship up to date. This is not going to be some kind of chronological catch up news story where I simply tell you what's happening now with the school team and what's happening in, in Europe and elsewhere in the world in terms of people promoting physical mediumship. I might occasionally touch on it, but feel free to ask in question and answers at the end if you, if you want specific information on specific groups of people. Okay, physical mediumship. What is it and should we pay attention to? So I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint and I need uh, maybe uh, Peter to give me a wave if it's come up in his screen. Yeah, good. And, and I, I've got the photograph there of the grave of the Fox sisters. And as you can see, that goes back to 1848. I like the idea that there is no death, that there are no dead. I like the idea that no one has ever died. But I don't say that very often to people who are experiencing grief because of their sense of loss. Nonetheless, that's what I've come to believe. And it's 
physical mediumship that has brought me to the point where I, there, there is no death. I, I have no fear of it. The painting in the middle does not have a particularly uh, mediumistic relevance. I just thought it was a modern, abstract painting. It's how spirit looked to me sometimes. And, and I'm not particularly clairvoyant. And I think it's got a splash of energy and color about it, because that's what I want you to see about modern physical mediumship. It's not the stuffy old orifice producing uh, ectoplasm in, in darkened <laughs> curtain corners, or at least it doesn't have to be like that. It can be vibrant and a real engagement with the nature of reality, particularly in these more uh, scientific uh, times of faster and faster progress. So, um, a definition then. The, the idea of physical mediumship limited to what you can poke, what you can feel, what you can grab a hold of is it's too simplistic. Uh, physical mediumship can involve invisible phenomena, uh, such as sounds, smells, tastes, uh, inexplicable voices, um, uh, rapping and tapping. Um, in the olden sort of days, there was regular use of percussion. It's a bit a little bit rare to find it now. And uh, emotions uh, that are stimulated, uh, uh, a sense of presence perhaps, being overcome uh, with sadness or emotion unexpectedly. These are the sorts of invisible and indeed intangible things which you sometimes get in settings for physical phenomena. And moving to the right then, uh, there are also things that are visible, but may be intangible. In other words, you see an object move. It's the movement that is visible, but you, you're not able to lay any physical contact on the force that produced the movement. Levitation is another example where it's visible, but you're not sure on what basis is someone or something being levitated. Orbs can be seen and uh, sometimes can be held in your hand, and I'll talk about that later. And uh, transfiguration, which is visible, but um, you have to look very closely to see the, the overlaid mask in someone's face. And then there's things that are invisible but tangible down the bottom left quadrant. The sense of being touched by an invisible hand it would be an example. And I'll be speaking about some of these experiences later. You can have all sorts of feelings, even internal physical feelings. And of course, healing would be an example of a, a physical uh, effect uh, that uh, a, a medium or a physical medium might be able to produce. And then we get to what people think of as the product of physical mediumship. The airports, 300 plus airports down in the school experiments uh, over three years. Ectoplasm. Uh, and I've heard uh, all sorts of horrible explanations as to what that contains. Um, table tilting, rapping, tapping, and so on, uh, even groaning, and, uh, and of course, lifting. Um, and I'll speak about an, uh, an instance uh, about table lifting in, in a restaurant later. Then there's a uh, automatic or spirit uh, writing. Um, there's the spirit art, of course, uh, video and audio recordings, and the anomalous effects on electrical equipment. Um, sometimes I get called into cases because the electrical appliances are going haywire, but no one is seen to operate them. And of course, you probably have a computer and you'll probably feel that the ghost is in the machine, but it may just be you. And that's a theme that I'm going to come back to again and again. The effects that you see outwardly from yourself may actually be you and your subconscious mind or your body energies, simply not being controlled and you having a lack of awareness, maybe because it's from your subconscious. 
So, um, the simple the definition would be to define physical mediumship as the manipulation of energies by spirits in perceptible ways, either perceptible to your senses or to recording machinery. Um, uh, video camera as a, a, an example. It's been around a long time. There's a whole history uh, lecture available uh, if you want to know about early reports of paranormal phenomena linked to an individual's presence um, in ancient history, in Bible accounts, in ancient art, uh, usually labelled in the past as witchcraft or shamanism or simply magic or cult mm. magic uh, or magical thinking, which is the tense of the new um, uh, insult uh, thrown by scientists, uh, anyone with woo-woo thinking. And generally speaking, uh, physical mediumship is denigrated these days. It's not considered believable by the general populace. It ranks way below UFOs. Um, and of course, it's not considered worth studying by, by very many people, uh, and that you just follow the money for that one. Um, there's very little funding for that kind of, of thing, even although there are groups that would allow it. Um, now, our American friends would like to claim the Fox sisters were uh, the source of the popularization of physical mediumship. Um, uh, and I, I don't really want to get involved in that kind of argument. Uh, personally, I don't rate history very much. And that might surprise you, but we don't learn the lessons of history uh, nearly as often as we should. Simply because something has been claimed for thousands of years doesn't mean to say it makes it more likely to be true. Indeed, it makes it more difficult to investigate. But if you're sitting there thinking, I might like to try and, and do a circle for physical phenomena, then what kind of things would you need to consider? I'll not read through the list. Um, feel free to ask me questions later if any of them don't make sense. But I can assure you this is a short list. This is what I can squeeze onto one slide. There's at least another two or three slides that I could add. And they get subtler and subtler. Uh, the more you think about it. For example, you join my circle, you've got an understandable wish to meet a deceased loved one. Well, I don't want you. Because what will happen is, in the circle, your, the energies will be skewed towards meeting that emotional need. And if it's unsatisfied, it will affect the energies available for other things. That's a very subtle thing that you might not even think of. But there are groups that have application forms with that level of uh, interest in the sitters. Now, the popular image, I've decided not to give uh, anyone a black and white image of the worst of Victoriana. Um, I, I just I don't want to lead you down that path. It's a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, whether or not the mediums in being photographed um, uh, are genuine. They don't look as if they're getting genuine phenomena from paper mache type faces. And I don't understand why a spirit are so clever they can intrude into our humble three dimensions, why they can't at least give you a decent face to look at. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, mediums uh, used to be thought to exude ectoplasm from every orifice. So in order to ensure security, they had to be body strip searched and searched in every orifice. And I can tell you that some people are still doing that today. So brace yourself if you decide to join a new group. Take a deep breath. I'm not for that. Um, the, um, the idea is that the uh, physical medium would be cut and off, sometimes in a corner, sometimes in a specially built cabinet. I've not just helped to build one, I've used them for years, and in my humble opinion, it's rubbish. It's, it adds an element of theatricality, which might trigger phenomena because of the switch that flicks in your head 
that because you're in the cabinet or someone else is, that something special is about to happen. Exactly the same reason why curtains are closed and opened in theatres and so on. But it doesn't have any magical quality in, its, in itself to have a wooden cabinet or to have a curtain across you. Indeed, it makes people wonder what you're doing behind the curtain. And, uh, and it raises unnecessary questions. It's not a matter of security because curtains can be pulled back. It's something to do with getting into a mindset that something special is about to happen. And then, of course, it's usually in a darkened room. Indeed, in my experience, a blackout room. There's a real push to make it at least partly lit, dimly lit. But for those of you that aren't familiar with the school experiments, let me tell you that Robin Foy, the host, um, gave me a rather arrogant laugh when I asked how much light there was going to be in the school hall, the cellar, where he held his seances. And, uh, and I say arrogant because that's how it came across. He simply laughed and said, don't worry about the light. We'll start off in total blackout underground. Spirit will provide all the light we need. And so they did. Think about it. With no electricity. There were so many orbs, we could see people, we could see the furniture, and they were making physical contact with the sitters. I'll come back to the fool who said it's IEDs on the end of a fishing line. Um, I'll deal with that later, um, because I, I was silly, foolish enough to consider that possibility myself um, before I took part. And then there's the traditional spirit trumpets, and ping pong balls and children's sweets, all of which can be manipulated on a table, perhaps with a crystal. Accoutrements, not enablers. There is no power, I don't think, in having things on a coffee table. The power comes from within you. But different energy methods are promoted now. And indeed, with the mediums that I sit with, there is no need for ecto ectoplasm because the lighter, finer, more powerful forms of energy in electric light, in broad daylight, are just as powerful as anything that I've read about uh, in, in past years with levers of ectoplasm. We don't need that. And it is thought to be better for the medium's health. I wonder if anyone knows, have there been medical surveys of the number of mediums who have diabetes? Every medium I know has digestive issues, usually faulty pancreas. And, uh, and I'm one of them. Uh, but I suspect that it's very common. Um, and and I, I think it's also common that mediums have a different sexual orientation um, than what one might uh, expect uh, from the majority of people. And I don't mean uh, any uh, uh, prejudice in that remark. It's simply an observation. And I think it might be to do with the way in which some people express themselves is conducive or not. And I would say that anyone with um, uh, same-sex orientations has the uh, finer sensibilities to be able to consider mediumship. But indeed, it would be true to take that to one side and say anyone with a sensitivity, regardless of your sexual orientation. It's just a passing question that I've wondered about in the past. So now we can produce physical phenomena in well-lit conditions, and it's not as hazardous. But I would want you to see physical mediumship in even broader terms than that. Move away from dark seances. Don't even go to them, perhaps. What about spiritual healing? That's physical mediumship. Absolutely because there are perceptible effects and there's a person being the facilitator or the catalyst or the channel. What about electrical anomalies? Synchronized spikes, perhaps, and random number generators that simply shouldn't happen. Telephone calls from the dead. 
something I've mainly read about, but it's happened to a couple of acquaintances, and it may have happened tonight. I received a text message from a friend, but she assures me she didn't send, and she lives alone and she hasn't touched a phone for hours. It was inviting me to go and see her. She doesn't even believe in this stuff, and she said, that's spooky, because there's only me here in the house, and I didn't send it at three minutes past six. What about appearing in photographs, or as it used to be called, photography? Anomalous photographs. What about the faces that appear, and the, the, the numbers and letters that appear in steam chambers? Because a medium standing beside it. We'll come back to that in a moment. That's what France is doing at the moment in terms of physical mediumship. These are all applications. These are all the exercise of the act or the art of mediumship, physical mediumship, because it has physical effects. But the mediums that I associate with want not even to be known as mediums. It causes all sorts of problems for them. Call them energy practitioners and you'll find that they, they smile a little more. Mediums is a stigma, maybe. Uh, a haunting from, yeah, the pun, I know. A haunting from an earlier part of, of last century, maybe. And I don't say that to be critical of mediums. I have most of my friends are mediumistic. I say it simply to pose the question, Maybe we need a different language for talking about something that's different from what it used to be, but it's still there. So let's just consider for a moment, how does physical mediumship relate to other paranormal phenomena? Where's its place in the pantheon and the, the list of priorities or importance? And I'm just hoping, yeah. Okay, so Dean Radin's my source for this one. And, uh, and uh, uh, if you could just glance over the text, you'll see that he has done a meta-analysis, uh, so it's plural, uh, he's done meta-analysis uh, in half a dozen areas, probably more now, um, of paranormal phenomena. And he has found that the odds are at least, this is minimum, a billion to one against it happening by chance. Go back to your science lessons, and your science teacher would probably be accepting 1%. And if he was really strict, he'd be saying to you, you know, you'd won a thousand before you can be sure that the thing you're talking about or observing is actually there. Well, now we're talking about a trillion to one, and no one's criticised Dean Radin's maths. Only the nitty gritty of some of the research methods in some of the tests. But if telepathy exists, you can strike off mediumship as the only explanation for mediums' messages. If clairvoyance or remote viewing, if, if perceptions can transcend space or time and distance and not be affected by it, by it and I'm going to give you some evidence for this before I finish, then maybe we don't need clairvoyance anymore as the only explanation for that phenomenon. And for those mediums or psychics who claim to be able to, to know when something's about to happen, well, pre-sentiment also has a billion to one in favour of it. Precognition, same odds. Influencing, and this is the one I want to emphasise, physical system at least a billion to one in favour of it. That's physical mediumship. If it's consciously done by an individual and it has a physical effect and it's observable either by the human senses or by recording equipment, it meets the definition. But they didn't have these systems a hundred years ago. We need to shift our perception even in the last 20, 30 years. There's been so much progress. In 1987, when the Scottish Society for Psychical Research was founded, you know how many websites there were? About 80, 87 perhaps. <laughs> it's more like 87 million now. It's just, we're in a different world. 
Spiritualism and physical mediumship existed in days when you had to take a horse or a cart to places, and that travel was slow and expensive, and people spent more nights in. There wasn't so much entertainment. I mean, they gazed into the fire, they would get strong impressions, and when they sat together, they would get even stronger physical effects. And then, of course, there's the Global Consciousness Project. I've got Lynn McTaggart's books on my shelf. And it doesn't seem to have accomplished a great deal since it was launched with much fanfare. But what they have found statistically significant is that random number generators do seem to respond to worldwide events. And the odds are above a trillion to one greater than chance. What does that tell you? It means you don't need now the one in a million gifted physical medium, the one individual in the UK who can do it. And incidentally, I think those figures are wrong. Maybe we can all do it. Certainly, large numbers of people can do this stuff. And that would be my interest in the Global Consciousness Project. If you're part of the global community, why should you be different? Why leave yourself out from the possibility of being a physical medium? Are there other scientific findings or even experiments that might relate to physical mediumship? Well, just before I come to the experiments, what about that? The Turin Shroud. That has to be physical mediumship. Has to be if that is Christ's body in that shroud. And we can listen to the scientists say, oh, it was burnt on, it was, uh, it was some kind of uh, sweat reaction with the chemicals and the cloth. I'm suggesting to you, if this is a permanent paranormal object, then Christ was a physical medium. Indeed, if you read the stories, it would suggest even for his healing miracles alone, you should be seen as that. But you'll not get too many ministers standing up and talking about Christ as a medium these days. Catholic Church would probably excommunicate you. Is this evidence of physical mediumship? A guy called Bill Rook down in Yorkshire took a photograph of a darkened field. There's the field on the left. He's holding his hand out, his left hand out. He's holding the camera on his right. He's taking a picture. And you can see all these little dots gathering around his hand. And he said to me, Nick, you've got to come and see this. It's fabulous. It's paranormal. And I said, no, it's not. It's raindrops, and it's the flash reflected off the blue of your anorak and the white or pinkness of your hand that's giving the pink tint and the blue tint to the raindrops. And as you can see, they don't illuminate as they go further away from the effect of the flash. And you said, but what about this? Pointing to the image on the right. He said, this was a darkened car park. No lights. Where did all that white stuff come from? Now think about it. Yeah, he's using a flash, but you would expect it to be like the left-hand image, where you can see the grass and eventually the darkness. Where's all the white stuff coming from? And it only apply, it only comes into certain photographs. There is no image on the right. Oh, there should be a white image. Is it just the white screen? Or is it just whiteness? Yes, uh, but, but thank you for pointing that out, because I'm just about to show you the next image. I told them that this is not paranormal. This is his outbreath, which happens approximately every 10 seconds or so. And sure enough, when you took 20 photos in two second uh, gaps, he, only some of them had the outbreath and it looked white. Bear that in mind if you get uh, some anomalous ghostly photographs. But he told me to stand back. And he apologized to the spirit beings that were present. He said, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Just come a bit closer so I can get a clearer image of you. The image on the left, I simply let Photoshop auto enhance it. I haven't used any special filters. And then I enlarged it and just heightened the contrast a little bit, not much. 
I defy anyone in here to say that's pareidolia. I gave it to a hundred people who have no interest in this field and gave them the whole picture with this in the top right hand quadrant and said nothing. 95 people out of 100 immediately said, what's the face in the corner? And how come it doesn't look human? It looks kind of humanoid or alien. And that was without being told the context within which Bill Rook took the photograph. Indeed, with proper manipulation by a professional, you would see the pink of the tear ducts in the eye. What is that? Well, I'm postulating that Bill Rook may be operating unconsciously, subconsciously, without the awareness that he's a physical medium, because these are certainly physical effects. And the good news is he's got 10,000 other photos he can show you. And he's just about to bring out a book and not a single scientist has shown an interest. What's that about? What are the French up to? They're just across the water. What are they doing about studying physical mediums? Well, they put a medium in one side of a steam chamber, they put a recipient of a message in the other side of the steam chamber, and guess what? When they fire a laser beam into the steam chamber, what they should get is a uniform spread of the same color of water molecule affected by the laser but only in that sense i've chosen only two photographs from about 20 that i've seen in a steam chamber what's that about well, it's obviously that something physical is happening because the medium is to the side of the steam chamber. It doesn't happen when the medium's not there. And when you ask the medium, where did you get that idea from? He said, spirit told me how to build the apparatus. Now, they've stopped because of COVID. And they say that the spirit world are genuinely frustrated that they can't make progress with experiment because of blooming human regulation. Did you think that COVID could affect the study of physical mediumship? What about Italy? My good friend Michele Dini Castro. He took a, an infrared photo, which is in the middle of this picture, in near darkness of a ghostly soldier. And I don't particularly expect you to be impressed by the graininess of the image. But I do expect you to be impressed by the blue image to the right of it. And the reason is because there were two cameras running. One was infrared and one was a heat thermal imager. And they were synchronized side by side and time stamped. And there was a double ring of security, a ring of investigators and an outer ring of castle security. And this happened in the middle of the night. As predicted by those people who said he tends to come out on the anniversary. Now, my question to you is, is Michele, who is encouraging this phenomena to reveal itself, and the phenomena is responding, and there are things about the photograph that I could talk to you about if you ask me in question and answers, that makes me think that that ghost soldier came to show himself. It was not a chance affair. Is Michele operating as a physical medium? He's certainly facilitating. There's certainly a physical act there. Look at the heat thermal imaging. Anybody reading these images knows that what's in the person's right forearm, sorry, upper arm, is uh, heat uh, uh, emanating from what could easily be a, a weeping wound. This makes it, incidentally, the best ghost, ghost photograph in the world because there's never been an infrared and a heat thermal imager taken in conditions of security. When we went to the castle uh, with uh, Michele, he stood beside me and he took a snap of the courtyard and he said, look at this. And that's what he got. He's never spoken about it since. He just shrugged his shoulders and said, these things happen to me almost every day. But if you look at the image, it appears to have a black slice on the left hand side, but you can't see it. There was no door there. 
the door was wide open. The blackness is part of the anomaly, not just the little blue orb or big blue orb, in fact. I even looked for reflections in the courtyard and the surrounding part of the courtyard, and there was nothing that corresponded to that. My question to you is, if I'm standing there, Michael is standing there, and spirit want to show themselves, which one of us is the physical medium? Now, those of you who know me know that I attended two sittings out of about 30 sittings with the school experimental group in the late 1990s. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, the details of my uh, experiences there. I will in questions and answers, but it would take up too much of um, my, what I want to say in this talk. But I can assure you that I've been to other seances run by the Noah's Ark Society by well-intentioned, sincere, but deluded people. And I've seen ham acting where they should have been channeling. And I've seen shadows uh, playing with the light where there should have been transfiguration. Um, but when I went to the school group, I was left in no doubt whatsoever. And I'm happy to explain to you why no conjurer could do what they were doing because I've spoken to professional magicians and special effects people in the movie industry. And they've given me convincing explanations why this can't be faked by them, but even with an unlimited budget. It wasn't temperature fluctuations, that's nothing. It was levitation of people as well as items, as well as furniture. It was 300 plus supports. Most of them were small, but one or two were not and were very interesting such as an out-of-date newspaper that hadn't yellowed, almost impossible. Even if you kept it in a vacuum, it would yellow over time. And then the lights, the law the lights, the lights could be held in your hand and enclosed and turned so that if there was any kind of fishing line attached, it would catch in your fingers. Musical instruments played, there was direct voice, there was uh, uh, healing, not on the occasion I was there, uh, but there was also paranormal photography and uh, uh, genuine uh, uh, clairvoyance, uh, manifestations of spirit beings. One shook my wife's hand and said, don't panic, dear. Uh, we've just come here to show you that we exist. And a chair levitated about 18 inches off the ground with someone waving their arm underneath to say, no, there's nothing holding it up, like an ectoplasmic rod, for example. And then the second visit, we were told to pause because the spirit team did not have access to the dimensions that were about to communicate with us. And I swear as God is my judge, and I'll sign a, an affidavit in any court in the country. Flying saucers flew into the room, flying objects of various shapes and sizes, um, about approximately 18 inches to two feet in, in diameter. And they flew around at high speed, never bumped into anybody, and then disappeared again. Where are you going to go with that? Some spiritualist seances took place before flights were invented. We live in a different age now. There's different phenomena coming in, as well as on top of the traditional stuff. These are four photographs in a total blackout cellar with no source of light except that provided by the spirit team. Um, I, I would love to be able to show you a video of it jumping about, but I can give you free access to the documentary that has a short video clip. These are just stills to give you some sense of what I was looking at. And these are not the craft in the second visit. These are what appeared in the first visit. Three investigators, a gentleman scholar and ex-president of SPR Montague Keene, a professor of electrical engineering, Arthur Ellison, a professor of psychology, David Fontana, and the established author. They're all dead now, if you believe in death. They're no longer around to argue their case. And here is where I feel disappointment that the SPR that they represented 
don't seem too bothered about this whole school experiment. It stopped. It was an inconvenience to start with because it was making extravagant claims about things that were produced in, in, in the complete darkness. But look at how carefully worded the verdict is. The three investigators encountered evidence favoring, and I'm just going to move your pictures, favoring the hypothesis of intelligent forces, whether originating in the human psyche or from discarnate sources, able to influence material objects and to convey associated meaningful messages, both visual and oral. It took them three years to come up with that statement, and it's carefully worded because it allows for the possibility that perhaps it's in our minds or some other human capacity as yet not identified, even although it could also be from discarnate sources. I'm pausing, yeah, I'm pausing only to, to introduce this couple. Okay, so the school experiment stopped in the late 1990s. What's happened since? I think it's a reasonable question. If there's a listener there who's uh, paid attention to the title of my talk, bring us up to date. What's happening? The answer is not a lot. Ten years later, when I was giving a lecture on this subject in Toronto, I phoned Robin Foy up and I said, uh, you claim that the school experiments were to be the dawn of a new uh, era of man-spirit communication, and that some of it was to do with applied technology. Literally a wristwatch, you could talk to the spirit world. And he said, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what we thought at the time. That's what spirit told us. I said, well, it was a failed experiment because it's not happened. You've had 10 years. Is there a single group anywhere on planet Earth who's able to produce that kind of phenomena on a reliable basis? And he said, no. Not one, except, except he said, two people in your home circle. And I was gobsmacked. It was Tom and Linda Anderson. They had just left my home circle some months previously because they were fed up with me being a, a, a scientist in my approach, uh, always evaluating, always trying to explain, take account of, measure, compare, always putting things down in my attitude, even although I believe such things are possible. Whenever we would get phenomena, we'd go, yeah, well, okay, but not really as good as the school experience. They get fed up with it, so they left. And they became bright and happy, and, and, and they actually they, they got married as a result of being in my circle. And I knew a lot of that giggling wasn't just because of the phenomenon. And, and they got spectacular success. So much so that I almost wondered whether I could trust what I was hearing. But knowing them as I did, I, I did trust it. And then they invited me into their seance, and it was every bit as good as school. Indeed, because I had six or seven seance sittings with them, it was better than school. But they stopped. Tom and Linda stopped for reasons that I'll go into very shortly. The little picture of the rose was one day when Tom walked into his dining room and there was a rose stuck to the ceiling. And he realized that there was a strange feeling in the room and he said to Spirit, what's happening? He said, go, but go out. He came in too quick. So he stepped out, shut the little dining room door, reopened it, and the rose had fallen to the floor with no visible mark from the ceiling where it came through, and it was fully stemmed. They said to him later, the act of observation caused it. Now, I once went to see Marcello Bacci in Italy, you know, the guy with the old valve radio. <laughs> used to bring three children's voices and the grieving mothers would be sitting and they would have a conversation in first name terms. And some SPR researchers didn't believe it, so they went and they took the valves out his radio and they still got the children's voices and they disconnected it from the main source and they still got children's voices and they took off the outer casing to look for a miniaturized transmitter and they still got children's voices for about 15 to 20 minutes after the power had been cut off. 
Michele said to me, Marcello, oh, Marcello, a gifted medium. Yeah, a physical medium, producing physical effects on his old radio for the betterment and the comfort of his audience. But it was difficult to manage. I'm going to say that about my friend Tom Anderson. He's a good friend, but he's difficult to manage. And here's the reason. He knows exactly what he's talking about because it's born of experience. I only know what I'm talking about because of other experiences. So when I join him, and I kid you not, full spirit people materialize. They let me shake their hand. They'll take away their body, but still leave me with the hand and the arm still visibly shaking. They'll produce children who'll run around and converse. Twice a child jumped into my lap. Here's the point. There were no small adults in the room. There, was no, there were no children in the building. I had the key, the only key, to the lock and the door, and I was close to it. How do you explain a young child jumping into your lap in these circumstances? He couldn't even be parachuted into the room. And that happened twice with Tom and Linda. They're quite laid back about it because they've had so much phenomena since. And here's the piece de resistance. They went out to Robin and Sandra Foy where they had retired in Spain. And they met them um, at least twice that I know of and physically materialized their spirit team for them, something they'd never been able to do in the school experiments. And they hugged and they kissed and they talked and they felt they'd been reunited with family. And hardly anybody knows that. Robin Foy, on the basis of the information that he got, has decided to set up a center in this, an area of Spain uh, for the exclusively for the production of physical mediumship and associated phenomena. And Tom says, sorry, that's not what Spirit said. And I know because it was a medium. Tom was with me just a couple of nights ago and he said, you've only given this talk in Edinburgh. And I said, oh, a few days. He said, I've got a photograph I want to show you. Actually, I've got two. He said, and it's orbs. And I said, oh, Tom, you know, orbs, orb photographs are ten a penny. You know, it's, they're really not evidential in terms of spirit presence. And he laughed. And he said, let me tell you about this guy. This guy works in a lumber yard and he swears a lot. He said, and I'll, I can tell you what he thinks of mediums and spiritualists and spooky stuff. He said, but I'd be having to swear for a few minutes. Doesn't believe in it at all. And he said, when I was standing beside him, I said, I'll prove it to you. And he went, how are you going to do that? He said, I'll take a photograph. And he went, how is that going to prove anything? Tom said, watch. And he said out loud, spirit, step back. And he took this photograph. And then he said, spirit, surround them. And about three seconds later, with that sanding machine never having been switched on, that's what he got. <laughs> the guy dropped his sander, ran out the lumber yard, and didn't come back for two or three weeks because he knew something had happened that you couldn't explain. I went to a tea room in Glasgow a couple of years back now, with Tom and Linda. And I uh, had bought a coaster in a shop which said, let's copy the hell out of this DM. And I slapped it on the bench table, which was big enough to sit six, maybe eight people. And the table rose two feet in the air and didn't move when I tried to push it back to the floor. And Tom was laughing and Linda was laughing at my reaction because I'm saying, this isn't fair in the proprietor. The customers are leaving. And so they were. And one other man had his coffee table bouncing as if it was dancing several inches from the floor, sometimes completely off the floor, but not as high. And he shouted for the waitress. He said, my table's wobbling. <laughs> and she came with some cardboard to stick under it. And there was a gasp to see that actually it was off the floor. I don't think spirit have lost the sense of humor. 
but it was brightly lit tea room. I've been with a couple of people, one of whom's in this audience, and I've said, come along and have a meal with us. You'll probably find the tables will slide around a bit. And they did. Not as much as they sometimes do, but they did. And they did so inexplicably. It would have been difficult to, to falsify it, particularly the timing. And I brought an investigator, who I think I'll keep anonymous for his embarrassment, who didn't believe that story until it happened to him. Every time he went to write in his notepad, the table slid away from him. And every time he threw his pen down, it slid back to him. And it did that with his partner, who had a separate table adjacent. That's physical phenomena. And, and the physical medium is helping to produce that. I've got some closing thoughts. And, and is it okay if I take about another five minutes, Anne? Here's my closing thoughts. Science has moved on since spiritualists huddled around their, their uh, cabinets. In one experiment which has been confirmed, human DNA was put into a sealed container next to a test subject. When the scientist gave the donor emotional stimulus, the emotions affected their DNA, which had been placed in another room. In the presence of negative emotions, the DNA tightened. In the presence of positive emotions, the coils of the DNA relaxed. And the scientist's conclusion was that this is suggestive of human emotion being able to produce physical effects that defy conventional physics. He couldn't explain it. And it was only a couple of studies. So somebody else went and did a similar experiment. This time they took white blood cells from donors and put them into chambers so they could measure electrical charges or changes. In this experiment, a donor was placed in one room and it was subjected to emotional stimulation through video clips. It generated different emotions in the donor. And the DNA was placed in a different room, but in the same building. Both the donor and his DNA were monitored, and the donor exhibited emotional peaks or valleys measured by electrical responses. The DNA, which was elsewhere, exhibited identical responses at the exact same time. Now, that's important because there was no lag time. There's no transmission time. The peaks and valleys of the DNA exactly matched the peaks and valleys of the donor in very precisely measured time. So scientists began to separate the donor from his DNA and they found they still got the effect when they separated them by 50 miles. Still no lag, no transmission time. Literally spooky action at a distance that Einstein referred to. So their conclusion was that somehow a donor is never separate from his or her DNA and that the connection can communicate beyond space and time. And then scientists did yet another experiment, the effect of DNA on our physical world. And they used light photons. I mean, they make up the world around us and they were observed inside the vacuum. And as you would expect, their natural photon locations were completely randomized. Human DNA was then inserted into the vac vacuum and shockingly, the photons were no longer acting randomly. In fact, they began to follow the geometry of the twisted DNA spiral. And scientists who were studying this were surprised. This was counter to what they expected. And they said, we have to accept the possibility that we're dealing with a new type of human energy. They believe that the human DNA is capable of shaping light photons, one of the purest forms of energy that we know. And then they realize by connecting these experimental findings, if our emotions affect our DNA and our DNA shapes the world around us, then our emotions are capable of physically changing the world around us. That's something that spiritualists studying mediumship and physical mediumship need to take account of. 
and it all mixes together. What are we dealing with? Supermind, unified fields, interdimensional connections, extraterrestrial contact or time portals. All of these new concepts before we even get to quantum physics, they exacerbate the confusion in our minds as to what it is that we're witnessing. What's the source of these energies? Now, I've been fortunate to know fantastic mediums, and I've received some revelatory messages. But just because they tell me something that's accurate doesn't make it evidence for life after death. Anyway, if they tell you something nice, it's going to affect your objectivity. How often do you know mediums to tell you something negative or upsetting? So note this. You can think what you like about mediumship, mental or physical. But I believe that it's the gold standard of evidence. If a spirit communicator materializes in front of you, shakes you by the hand, allows you to feel up the arm, which is solid, until you get to the shoulder, and there's no body attached, but the conversation and the handshake is continuing. When your wife levitates in front of 14 witnesses, if I trust her with my life, why would I not believe her when she describes the internal sensation of a light orb shooting inside her ribcage? And for those of you who say, oh, no, I'm quite prepared to believe that's possible. Next spirit can do these things with orbs. I would say, yeah, so how do you explain the flying saucers thing? Maybe we need to be talking about extraterrestrial or otherworldly, other dimensional contacts. Tom and Linda Anderson have continued the work of school. But they don't want really too many people to know about it, and they would reluctantly give me permission to tell you tonight. What they do, they do behind closed doors. They don't want publicity. They've never accepted money. They're not interested in training. And as Linda said to me yesterday evening, we don't do this to prove anything. Not even to ourselves. We've had enough phenomena to know that spirit and energy can be used for good. So let us go on with it. We are not egocentric. We don't ask spirit to jump to our agenda. We say to spirit, what do you want us to do for the greater good? How do we spread loving kindness? And they tell us. And sometimes it involves distant healing. We don't need to persuade your audience, and we don't even want them to come and talk to us about it. You're getting on with the job in hand. And here's the real challenge, if you think I've been just a bit in your face and provocative. Here's the real challenge. You can do this too. Don't buy into the one in a million psychology that says you need to pay a blooming fortune to get into a seance and then see some rickety conjuring. There are famous names out there that I know are cheating. And I'm not going to name them because they would sue me. If, if you want to make progress, this is how you do it. You choose your sitters very carefully. You make sure that you share the same positive intentions. Literally, the collective power of the shared love within a group, you will achieve higher vibrations through your relationship bonds. Most people don't sit in selfless love. They sit in the selfish hope of production, like phenomena junkies, and they don't even have the patience that I did for 10 years. So now my wife and I sit, and we don't get as much phenomena, but we know spirit are with us every single day. And I was asked by my spirit guide, do you want us to entertain you a while longer, or can we go on with the business that we came here for, which is healing and help and guidance? I must need a lot of guidance. I think I'm a slow learner because I'm still getting it. There is no shortcut to the miraculous. But please, if you do have an experience, honour it. 
by telling the world. And I've even said that to Tom and Linda, but they're not in that place yet where they can do it. You're not going to get a truth that you can pay for as easily as you'll get growth when you're doing the searching, when you're doing the mediumship work. Yeah. Questions and answers, maybe, but... Thank you, Nick. Thank you for an excellent talk. That was, that, that was brilliant. Yeah, we're getting virtual applause here, and we've got some lovely comments coming in uh, online, too. Um, so I'm going to pass on to questions now. So if you've got a question to ask... Can I, can I say something just before I take uh, questions? Sure, Nick. I've, I've been speaking as if people have some knowledge of the stroll experiments and so on. If there's anybody sitting there saying, I don't know what he was talking about, I'm happy to go over the, 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 the main points of that, but I'm not going to do it if people know. So, yes. Yeah. So, Anne? I think we might have lost Anne. Okay. Not for long. Not for long. I think she might have jumped out and back in on a better signal. Okay, I'm happy to field questions. If anybody would like to unmute yourself or give me a wave of your hand and I'll unmute you. Anne? Yes, I'm back. I'm back. I don't know what happened there. I lost my connection there. I don't know um, just what happened. So it's a physical mediumship, I think. <laughs> um, I've got a chat question. Yes, okay. Will I take it over? You want yes, to? Yes, sure. Um, please send your, share your link on the, on the documentary. Can you do that? Um, I, I can, but it would take me just about five minutes, maybe, to find um, it. Can you send it, if you can send it to me, Nick, I'll make sure. It, I can tell you, it's it called goes... Afterlife Investigations. The director producer was Tim Coleman. And it's it's a, a short, uh, roughly 50 minutes, introduction to that three-year school experiment. And it mentions Batchy and one or two other people. So if you Google the afterlife um, investigations and the name Tim Coleman, you'll definitely get it on YouTube and it's free. It shouldn't be free, but it is. Okay, do we have any questions? Um, there's Peter, I've got his hand up. Peter. Can't stand what? silence, so I'm gonna ask Nick a question. Um, Go on then. Nick, I used to live in Norfolk where the school experiments took place. It's a very strange place, Norfolk itself. And I was wondering how much, if at all, you think uh, the locus had to do with the, the, the effects that came through and the experiences that, uh, that, that materialized. Yeah. Um, I think it, the locus helps. I think environments can be conducive, but only in the very obvious kind of sense. Um, uh, I would avoid electrical fields, I would avoid noise or um, uh, frequent change and rappings and tappings coming from piping and so on. Um, and I would go for a quieter um, place with fewer distractions. Um, the, Stroll, the village of Stroll is not very far from the St. Michael Mary's ley line that cuts right across England. And uh, Dowsers claim that there's enormous, uh, enormous earth energy travels along that line and it would reach the village of Stowe and their cellar was underground uh, or road level. So um, the, I personally don't rate that as an explanation and I've done dowsing successfully. Uh, I think it's more complicated than that because the school group went to America and went to someone's garage and produced exactly the same quality of phenomena. And uh, I mentioned Tom and Linda, they've been to France and been to Spain, don't know about Germany and uh, various places in Scotland and England, and there's never really been any difference in the quality of the mediumship. So, conducive, but not essential. Thank you. Okay, I can see that Hazel, thank you, Hazel. Um, Hazel has shared 
the link on the chat uh, for everyone. You can thank you for up, doing that, Hazel. Yeah, uh, you can pick it up there. So thanks, thanks, Hazel. Uh, there's also a number of points from Gail. Um, Gail, I don't know if you want to answer, ask the questions yourself. Uh, you, I can see you there. You can unmute yourself. You've asked about setting up a circle. You've said you're <coughs> abroad, and you're asking what Nick is doing now. So um, where where are you, Gail? You say you're abroad. Yeah, I can see you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm based in Barcelona. Barcelona. Okay. Do you want to put your questions to Nick? But well, apart from that, I just wanted to ask Nick how he's been dealing with lockdown and how's he been progressing with physical mediumship and if he's been able to connect with other mediums or practitioners in this, how he's got round it. Yep. I, I practice and teach meditation. Yep. Uh, I run classes and uh, until recently I ran them online during COVID. And I'll be honest with you and I'll apologise in advance if this seems insensible. But I've not really noticed lockdown because if I go into a state, an altered state through meditation, it's as if there are no walls around the body. And I don't mm. say that I say it because that's the best antidote, if you like, to the COVID restrictions that I can think of. Uh, plus, uh, my wife's here to keep me company and, and, and her, uh, me for her as well. Um, but um, th there was another part to your question about meeting up with other mediums. Um, I've, I've extended my bubble a little bit to include three mediums, but we don't meet in each other's houses for the purposes of sittings. And, uh, and I uh, uh, have a sitting for spirit twice a week, one of which is only for healing and one of which is for an interaction. And uh, it's just my wife and I that sit present. Other mediums say they'll join us um, as and when, but they're waiting for spirit to tell them. And it's a different psychology. If you're a, a medium, you say to spirit, what do you want me to do here? And that's what determines your action. And I've done that for COVID. And they've not always said parrot style, what Nicola Sturgeon has said. I, I okay. don't know, don't know uh, whether so I missed it. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Gail. Bill, are you, do you have a question there? Yeah, I don't know whether I missed it, but um, <clears throat> I wonder if you could just clarify why Tom and Linda Anderson ended their circle. Um, yeah, uh, one reason was that their own relationship was under strain. And although they still are very close friends, they are no longer in that strong partnership they used to have. And they felt that the diminution of their feelings towards each other uh, affected the loving bonds that previously had led to the uh, strength of the spirit connection. But having said that, individually, they both continue to connect with spirit. And I can tell you, not as a result of this call, but as late as yesterday, they said that they have uh, been told by spirit they will be restarting a home circle, but not yet. In other words, presumably when COVID restrictions relax. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. But there is another reason, and I just want you to think for a moment about the best way to say this, because these are quite personal decisions that they've made. Um, yeah, they, they, they had reason to believe that what they were doing was becoming dangerous. And you can interpret that as dangerous to their health, dangerous to their social relationships, their wider reputations. And here I'm going to say something, and I'm not quoting them, but I think it's relevant. Do you think if we came out with what Spirit's able to do, that somebody wouldn't try to capture it, weaponize it, use it for commercial gain, exploit it, try and make their reputation from it? And you know one of the most favorite ways to establish a reputation and build yourself up? To put people down. I don't think it's a good thing to do, but it seems very popular. 
Tom and Linda have been subject to character assassination in the press, in the courts, and in their friendships and students. Terrible, and I've watched it. They don't want to continue to harm themselves, but they do want to continue to work for spirit. That's as cool an answer as I can give you, given the private nature of what's going on in their lives. Okay, thanks, Nick. Is, does that answer your question, Bill? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. We've got a, a, a question here. Um, hold on a second. Uh, two questions here. One from, from Diane first. She says, what do you think of animals or aliens materialising as real as me or you? Uh, um, I was with Tom and Linda Anderson in an Italian restaurant in Glasgow and I got nudged around the kneecap twice and it felt like my Labrador used to nose me to get attention and I looked under the table and there was no one sitting with their knees outstretched or able to hit me like that and it wasn't painful but I, I did think that a dog had come in and gone under the table. And Tom turned to me and said, oh, it's all right. It's just my pet Troy he died a year or two ago. And at that very moment, I was getting the swish of a tail because the dog had turned its attention to Tom. And I was getting the back end hitting me frequently, maybe half a dozen times. I looked under the table. There was no dog there. But I know what I experienced. I've also had pets turn up in my own home who have passed. The bed goes down, you know, the cats jumped onto it. Um, is that enough of an answer, or did you want more? Yeah. Can I can I come back to Bill just for a moment, because there's something I should say in answer to that previous question. Mm -hmm. Bill, can he's still you, here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Bill, uh, uh, if you were to speak to either Tom or Linda Anderson they would tell you they consulted Spirit when they started their experiments and they consulted Spirit and took their advice about stopping their experiments, their, their work uh, with physical medium. So it's just that's something they would say was really important. They, they worked for Spirit as long as Spirit wanted them to work with them and they have been told the work will resume. Okay. Yes, I believe with the Skull Circle, uh, well, Am I not correct in thinking that um, Spirit gave them information that led to them closing that? Well, I mean, the, the school experiment is far enough in time now for me to speak a wee bit more freely than what I did at the, at the very time it happened when they stopped. Um, Robin Foy has said to me, uh, both in writing and uh, face to face, that the, the the spirit team said there are people trying to get in through the energy doorway or portal that we have created here, and they are time travelers, and we can't stop them except by closing down the portal altogether and stopping the work, which is what they did. It was upsetting, it was sudden, but it was in the best interest of all concerned, and the spirit team said. There are dimensions to which we do not have access, but they're trying to get access. Yeah, I see. <clears throat> okay, Th thank, thank you uh, for that, Nick, and thank you, Bill. And I'm going to go back to Diane for a moment, because I think she had two parts of her question. You've talked about animals materialising, and I'm certainly aware of that as well, but I think the other part of her question is about aliens materialising. Diane, you're online, is that correct? Is that your question? Yeah, I didn't mean dogs or cats. I meant, I meant like big gorilla bear looking things with clothes on, with robes on. I'm laughing only because I've got a four foot gorilla behind this door. And I'm happy to show it to you. Just, it's a synchronicity, that's all. Um, okay, um, aliens manifested or materialized at the school experiment. And I'm saying aliens, some people don't like the term because they feel it's misleading. Uh, let's just say um, beings that, that do not belong on Earth. Some of them may have a physical existence elsewhere. Some of them have a non-physical existence. 
but they're still a able community. And uh, and Tom and Linda Anderson, their siblings, had some of that experience as well. Yeah, did they um, like why experience? They had a consciousness. This was the thing. It had a consciousness, but it didn't stay where it was. It actually moved. I don't mind seeing things if they don't move towards me, but when they move towards you, like why would they do that? Why? Well, <laughs> it's scary. Uh, can I tell you how I would see that completely differently? And, I, and it's not meant by criticism. I genuinely think you might be the safer option, right? If I spend all my life looking for a white rhino and eventually I find one, I'm not going to go run screaming in the opposite direction. I'm going to go closer and try and understand it and maybe even get to know it. And I feel the same way about spirit. It's rare enough for me not to back off even when I'm slightly, well, no, I don't get scared, but slightly taken aback by the appearance. I would move towards it, always. And in fact, see if you ever do any boxing, right? Your boxing trainer will say, if you've got a choice, always move towards, always move towards, always move forward. It's uh, better for success. And I think it's better for spirit. Unless we're talking about negative entities. We haven't been so far because I don't have much experience of them. And yeah, no, I, I do, I do feel it was a healing of some sorts however I did I just I kind of get a bit scared in case something comes towards me again when I see something Ken. I would because like I to kicked it and I could have hurt the medium this is a problem yes, yes because I had no idea what was going on I was so young at the time oh. well yeah I'm glad you're still around to tell the story I'd like well, to so hear my Thank you very much, because nobody's ever told me if it was, but as long as it's negative, ah. because, yeah, okay. But thanks, thanks, Thank Diane. you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Can I make a more general point? Is that yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, all the work that I do, all the work, with spirit, with mediumship, with meditation, with house investigations and so on things, I always ask for protection, and I always get it. I think if I didn't ask for protection, at some point, the haunting would haunt me. And uh, it's just a little reminder to people, don't think this is all fuzzy wuzzy fairyland stuff. I have been attacked by negative entities, but thankfully only uh, once that I'm sort of able to talk about it. Okay, Thank Thank, so thanks much. Diane. Um, I, we've got another question from Pauline. And she says, uh, could Nick clarify the relationship between the two photographs that you showed, uh, the hand with the flash and the re reflections in the night and the white one, um, wh where yeah. you, you expanded it to show the face. Where was the second one taken? She's asking you. Um, so if I quickly just go back to the, the point um, uh, issue, it was here, yeah? Mm. Start the um the start the slide no. no it's the one in the, you said one was in the car park and one was the one with the hand with the orbs it was it was um yeah. this here was taken uh, in, in a grassy uh, field this uh, hand and then next to the field there's a car park and I was standing with Bill in the field and in the car park. We're and not seeing that. We're not seeing that, Nick. We're seeing uh, the Fox sisters. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, um, if I can stop my share and then go back into my share, yeah, it would be a PowerPoint physical medium chip talk. Okay. What do you see uh, now? Uh, we see the faces now. But okay. It's the one with the hand, and it's Bill's hand, you know, and with the orbs, that one we're looking for. Do you see the uh, Bill's hands now? No. Oh. You may yeah. have to go in and out of it. Okay, so uh, stop share. Share the screen. Oh, Pauline says, no, it's this. 
No, it's this one. Um, is that the one, Pauline? Just is that one? Is this one right? Okay, is this it, Pauline? Yeah, and so it was just the the relationship. So that we we saw the first photograph, and then he explained, you know, there was reflections from the jacket and the flash of the photograph, and then we could see the just that white whited out image on the right hand side. But the whited out image was to let you see that it doesn't look as if there's anything paranormal other than a whiteness in a dark scene. But actually, if you look closer, not at this image, which I believe is out there, but at such images, you will see, and it's the next uh, image that was taken seconds later, you can see on the left that the mist has faded a little bit, revealing the top right-hand quadrant, and it looks like a face. And then I've cropped it, enlarged it, and just a little bit of contrast, just to make it stand out a bit more. Mm -hmm. So what was happening here was that Bill was asserting the paranormality of his photographs by holding out his hand and pointing out that he was capturing orbs. And I said to him that that wasn't paranormal. It was how moisture reacts to a flash when it bounces off clothing and his hand. And you can see from the color of the orbs that that's the case. And then he said, but what about this? How can I take a photograph of a dark scene? And I can't remember whether he was pointing at the field or the car park or adjacent. And he said, and I get this, and it was white, but it was only white for about two images out of eight or 10. And I said, well, that's not paranormal. He said, well, how come I'm not getting it all the time then? Sometimes I get dark images and sometimes I get white. And I said, that's because of your outbreak. And he said, just step back a bit, he said, and he turned to, as far as I was concerned, the dark space. And he said, don't listen to him. Just come a bit closer so I can get a better photograph of you. And that's the photograph that you're looking at with the face. The, the point I would make is that, I mean, I, I've done a test of 100 people, and they all say that's a humanoid face without being prompted. Uh, and they all identify the top right-hand quadrant as, as being where the, the strangeness is. But what I would say is, don't be put off when phenomena is expressing itself in a way that you don't value or you don't respect. Why should the paranormal conform to your false um, predictions about it or expectations about it? And if you just persevere sometimes, what seems to be not awfully impressive will leave you straining to give an explanation. I mean, does anyone here think that that face is uh, paradoxical? Because it hasn't been falsified at all. And I've been clear about exactly what I did. Photoshop, auto enhance it. It's a general lock settings for like brightness and so on. And then I darken the contrast when I enlarge the form. I think there's something there. And Bill was actually correct. It was me that was wrong because I'm saying, oh, it's just water vapor and it's moist and I'm explaining it away. But you persevere and that's what you get. Yeah, good picture, Nick. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, okay, thank you, Pauline. Um, I'm moving on quickly because time is running out and we've got another last two questions. Um, Peter says uh, it might be useful to talk a wee bit about Tom's background and amazing recovery from what should have been death. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, essentially, um, Tom is ex-special forces, okay? Hit by a bus, I think it was, and left with umpteen fractures and more than a dozen operations on his spine and his pelvis was crushed and so on. Months and months of agony. And then the consultant said to him, I'm sorry, Mr. Anderson, you'll probably spend the rest of your life in a wheelchair. And he laughed in the consultant's face and he said, no, 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 I've already paid my entrance fee for the Glasgow Half Marathon, which is in so many months' time. He said, I intend to take part in it. And the consultant said, if you can even walk part of the course unaided, I'll give you a thousand pounds to any charity of your choice. So when Tom turned up, having completed the entire half marathon and showed the medal and his time, now, I can't remember his time, but I was told it was a creditable time. So there was no shame in it. it. didn't have to 
walk slowly. And when he handed it, he got his cheque, donated it to charity, and he has since been invited to speak to junior doctors in Glasgow about the power of the mind to heal the body. Because, and this is the point of the story, the secret was visualization in a meditation state, an altered state. And he visualized a team of little men coming out of his brain twice a day for at least an hour each time, sometimes two hours, and they would French polish his fractures. There are plenty of them. And much, much later, when someone said, excuse me, Miss Anderson, where did you say that fracture was? He burst out laughing. He reckoned these French polishers had done such a great job that even the medics couldn't find where the broken bone had been. That's the story. And if you want to read about it, uh, the short form of it, um, it's in Dr. David Hamilton's book, uh, The Power of the Mind to Heal the Body. Okay, um, for that question, Peter, I'm uh, moving swiftly on as we're just about out of time. But as a human-like looking forms in different heights and moving through the dark seance room, stretching hands towards the sitters, is that the energy of the sitters making that happen or is that spirit expressing themselves? There you go, Nick. Okay, can you just give me the opening description of the figure because it sounds a bit dark to me. Yeah, human-like looking forms in different heights or shadow forms. Barbara, are you on? Do you want to um, uh, ask Nick this yourself? You can unmute yourself and ask him this question. Barbara Spears. I can't, I can't see her here um, at the moment, Nick. I'll, I'll answer it, uh, but I have very little experience. Um, okay, so 30 years of sitting in seances, let's say roughly once a fortnight, maybe once a week, something. Um, I've had two sittings that I've closed down because I felt there was a negative presence. Out of hundreds and hundreds. Why is that? Because I always ask for protection and every sitter is the same. And we only sit for, uh, to ask to be surrounded by the utmost positivity and only to experience the gifts of spirit communication, love, joy, peace, happiness, harmony, healing, and so on. So we don't get unwanted visitors who are a bit scary or frightening or dodgy or devilish or demonic. I'm not even sure demons exist, uh, and I've met uh, one or two uh, people who claim to possess and so on. So, you know, I, I don't have much experience of that. And I think if I was in a circle where I was getting approached by scary human light creatures, I think I would stop and do a reboot. Uh, I should have said a restart. I was thinking I would boot up the taxi, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I would restart and I would express uh, tighter control over the positivity of what we were having as a share part. Okay, thanks Nick. I'm going to move on quickly because we're just about, we're really out of time. And we've got a last question from Katrina that says, how did negative entities attack you? And what can, can one do when they are actually attacked? So there's a good question to finish on. Okay, I was looking for a film uh, location, a haunted house for a film, a film production. Um, and, uh, and I went to uh, Callot House, which was opposite South Ballyhoolish, across the water of the loch. And uh, uh, my friend said to me, go to that house, it's definitely haunted. You see a bouncing light going down the hill, down the glen, and into the house, and disappear. And it's ha been happening for generations, so there's definitely something going on there. And when I went, the house was dilapidated with water running down the inside the wall. But it had been a down at heel uh, mansion or manor. Um, as I was leaving it, cut the story short, having decided it was an unsafe location for a film crew, um, I was standing with my back to the corner of the front public room and uh, I was trying to blend with spirit and I was sensing an energy behind me and my wife and my friend looked across at me and said, Nick, walk towards us. And I said, yeah, I'm just, I'm just kind of tuning in here. They said, no. Walk towards us right now and don't look back. And of course, I thought it was a wind up. So my friend came and grabbed me by the lapel and pulled me out. And as I got to the car park, I began to do some projectile vomiting. 
only for about two minutes. But I had not been sick previously. I hadn't eaten anything unusual. I was fine about two minutes later. And my friend, who says he knows about such things, says it's just your body getting rid of energy it doesn't like. Don't worry about it. But what my wife and my friends saw, which I didn't, was like a dark cloud with a head, space, shape, and uh, shoulders with emerging arms, uh, like a sort of infestation of blackness about to go around me. And as the as the shoulders or arms were extending to the side of my arms, I got pulled away. That's what they say they saw. If you like, a human shadow. And how do you protect yourself? Was the second that question? On, on that occasion, I was working for a film company, so I didn't expect to experience anything very much. I was looking for an atmospheric location. But um, maybe it helped me to make sure I do that in future, and I'm certainly more careful now. Okay. Okay, we're right out of time, so so thank you. That was a ooh, scary one to finish on, so thank you. And I'm just going to check because um, I have been experiencing some physical phenomenon on this uh, session and I had on the last one as well. Um, I've just checked while Nick was talking to make sure everybody was muted because I can hear somebody speaking to me uh, through my earphones. Um, I have had that before and yes, we can just put it down to interference, but um, there is a man speaking here. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again to Nick Kyle. Excellent talk, um, excellent discussion. Thank you very much, Nick, and we'll certainly have you back again. And I think we'll have you doing some of that uh, teaching of meditation and other things at the Art Conan Doyle Centre next year, if you're up for that as well. And um, that'll be another, thank you, that'll be another invitation. So to everyone else, I'll say this is my uh, last formal uh, evening to host as chair because I'm retiring at the end of the year but let me tell you of some exciting things that's coming up. Um, we've been advertising our Saturday Dems, we've got a winter's pass, um, it's only £30 for 10 Dems so that's saving £20 and the Tuesday talks, these Tuesday talks, if you look at our website we've got a tremendous lineup for next year and we've had a Black Friday deal on um, you've just missed that one, but it's still a saving. It's only £45 for 12 Tuesday Talks. So go to our website and grab that one because we're, as I say, we've got an impressive lineup for next year as well. Peter, did you want to say something? No, you're just waving goodbye. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> He's just waving goodbye, I think. Uh, are you just, yeah, you'll need to unmute yourself if you're saying something to me. You advertised it today as 40 quid. You've just shoved a fiver onto it. I know, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but that was to my that was to my team. I didn't realise the Black Friday deal finished uh, last week. I'm a bit behind here. Um, oh, wait a minute, we only got that offer today. I know, I know, but it came out on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scott's laughing at me. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. And um, I say, I hope you'll uh, grab some of these deals we've also got a christmas talk i don't think i don't know if that, that's advertised or not yet scott um on the 17th of december he's nodding his head um so have a look at our, our website as well and um, sandy mccall smith is going to be doing a christmas talk with lance um, so that's worth coming on to on on a special on the 17th of christmas evening but to everyone thank you everyone thank you for being here thank you again nick and um See you again soon. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you and good night. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Nick. Good night, everyone. <laughs>